actually part of my reason for being here tonight is also the fact that you've got in the Atkinson Gallery at the moment uh, an exhibition uh, on Cape Farewell and I'm part of the science side of Cape Farewell which is about arts and culture but it's also about the science of climate change we're going to talk a bit about that this evening. I had a very nice introduction there, in fact you've been told you heard what I do most of the time, you said, there we go. Uh, I'm a senior tutor and associate professor at Southampton. Um, I do a lot of work. I'm a physical oceanographer by training, um, although I do a lot of work on other things, not just the physics of the oceans. That's my main area. Oceanography, oceanography is a sort of the science of the oceans. It includes the physics of the oceans, tides, currents, um, ocean temperatures, climate change. It also includes things like marine biology, sharks, whales, dolphins. We've all been swimming with whales and dolphins at various stages. Uh, it's not as exciting as you might think. Their breath stinks. Um, but also uh, involves marine chemistry, looking at things like ocean acidification, uh, CO2 uptake. It involves marine geology, marine geophysics. Huge area at the moment, looking at do we or do we not to extract minerals from the deep sea. And, and, and. It's reckoned that about 80% of the remaining reserves of oil, gas and minerals are on the seabed or below the seabed. So it's an important area. It's a vast area of study. My main areas, <clears throat> I'm a seagoing oceanographer. Um, I like working at sea. The bottom line is, since I was about so high, I like playing with boats, so I get play, paid to go and play with boats these days, which is as good as it gets. Um, I also do a lot of work using satellites and aircraft, so I get to play with aircraft as well as boats. There aren't many jobs where you can go in aircraft and fly around the world and sort of uh, sample the oceans from, from aircraft. Uh, I've not been up in space yet, but um, give it time. Um, but also, we look at things like marine pollution. So uh, I and my team developed systems where we can use aircraft to measure oil spills, not to see where they are, but look at the oil spill thickness and also the type of oil. Whenever we get a big oil spill, the oil is, there are two components. There's the cargo oil, the stuff that's being transported, but also the ship itself has its own oil for propulsion. And so we need to know what the oil is that we're dealing with. And it's very difficult to do that, so we develop uh, algorithms and techniques using aircraft, which means we can fly over an oil spill um, on a regular basis, which you can't do with satellites. Also, satellites can't see through clouds very well. Uh, we can with the aircraft, although sometimes we do fly the aircraft illegally low to get below the cloud, but hey-ho, um, just, just, just so we can track the oil spills. But we work on all kinds of stuff. Uh, I've done work on Venice Lagoon, looking at seagrasses. Uh, we worked off the coast of Chile, coast of Brazil, and so on. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. And we also do a lot of work with media as well. So the ocean. It's big. And most people, their view of the ocean is they go down to the sea for the day, maybe they go out sailing or something, and they see a very small component of the oceans. And we often get, sort of, when we look at things like plastics in the oceans, people say, well, we can go out there, we can filter the oceans, we can clean all the plastics up and that sort of thing. Do you any idea how big the ocean is? If we give each person on the planet their own private two-metre-deep swimming pool, how big do you think that swimming pool is going to be? Do you reckon about the size of this room? So you've got something like 8 billion people. They're each getting a two-metre-deep swimming pool of seawater. What are we looking at? A two-metre pool that's the size of this room, size of a rugby pitch, football pitch, size of the school. What do you reckon? Football pitch? Um, it's 93 square kilometres, about the size of Southampton. So you've each got a pool the size of Southampton as your private swimming pool of two metre water. Move quickly, <coughs> the real estate that's around the Caribbean and the surface is going quickly. If you don't move, then you'll end up with your two metre pool somewhere in the deep ocean in the southern ocean where it's cold, dark and miserable. But it gives you an idea of how big the oceans are. They are huge. Now, in the early days, um, sampling the oceans was very basic, and so my job is often sampling the ocean. So here you can see, in the early years, you've got a boat, you've got an engineer, there's the engineer, you've got the navigator, you've got the administrator who's in charge, and you've got the scientist who's obviously, <laughs> obviously observing the ocean. Nowadays, we have a lot more technology to help us. So nowadays, we have satellites, we've got aircraft, I do a lot of work with both aircraft, satellites, and ships. Um, as I said, I like playing with planes, I like playing with ships, so it's a good job for that. But also, we have a lot of robotic systems. We have mini submarines, which we send around the world. In fact, the National Oceanography Centre, where I'm based, is the world's centre for underwater robotics. 
So we have engineers, we have uh, scientists, technicians and so on, building these autonomous systems which go out and sample the ocean. And we're going to see some data from those in a short while. So we're building up a very detailed picture of how the oceans work. And when people often say, well, we don't have much data going back very far, we have data, detailed data going back probably about 100 years now, giving us an idea of how the oceans have been changing over the past century. And one of the biggest problems we have in the oceans today isn't plastics, it's actually climate change. And the oceans are warming up. And they're warming up by, well, so far, they've warmed up by about one and a half degrees Celsius. The surface layer of the ocean has warmed up since uh, the turn of the 1900s. Here, we can see here, we're putting this as a sort of 1971 to 2000 average. And we've seen a gradual increase, it's minus one there, up to, well, nearly one actually, nearly two degrees rather than one and a half degrees. And this is where we are pretty much today. And we've seen a steady increase in our ocean temperature. And that's important because the oceans, seawater, has a huge heat capacity. The specific heat of seawater is enormous compared to the atmosphere. And so all that energy that's coming in, that excess energy coming in from the sun, is being stored in the ocean, not in the atmosphere. And that has an important impact in the long term on our atmosphere as well. So what causes it? Well, it is CO2. You might read the Sun or the Daily Mail and they'll tell you it's nothing to do with CO2 and we're all fine and we keep driving our 4x4s. it will be absolutely fine because it's all a bunch of scientists making money and it's all not true. The data, the information is there. This is data from the um, Mahona Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, several of my colleagues work there these days. It's a tough place, but you know, sometimes you have to work in Hawaii. And they use Hawaii as a place for monitoring global gases mainly because it's fairly remote. Okay, at the moment, it's a bit polluted with fires and things. But normally, if have got fires, then it's a very remote part of the world. Middle of the Pacific, it doesn't get contaminated. And you can see here, um, you can see the sort of gradual increase from 1960. The natural levels of CO2 in the atmosphere should be about 280 parts per million. We need CO2. Without CO2, we basically live on a snowball. We need a bit of CO2, because CO2 acts as a greenhouse gas. <coughs> How does it work? It's like glass in the greenhouse. Light gets in from the sun, and the bulk of energy coming into the Earth's system comes as light from the sun. Not as heat, but as light. And that light warms up the surface. It's then radiated back out into space as infrared. People often think about the sun being sort of lots of infrared energy. There's very little in infrared energy from the sun. It's all as light it goes back out as infrared. Glass lets the light through. It warms up the greenhouse. The infrared energy is then trapped by the glass. Glass is a really good trap of IR. And CO2 and greenhouse gases like methane, nitrous oxide do the same job. They're like glass. They stop the thermal infrared going back out again. Think about a cloudy night. You go out on a cloudy night, water vapor is a good one as well. It's quite warm. You get a clear night, it's really cold because all the energy is going back out into space. And CO2 acts as an insulator. We need some CO2, otherwise we'd freeze. But it's a bit like putting your summer duvet on in the middle of, sorry, your winter duvet on in the middle of summer. If you have too much CO2, you overheat. And we've now gone from 280 parts per million. In fact, the last figure I got, this is going right up to about three weeks ago. Uh, we are now breaking 420 on a regular basis. There are wobbles. You can see here we get seasonal change. In fact, if I zoom in a bit, you can see that seasonal change here. You'd expect that. You get, this is Northern Hemisphere, so you get Northern Hemisphere summer and winter with CO2 uptake by plants and things. But you can see that very steady trend increase in CO2. And the same thing goes when we look at methane. Methane is also a very potent greenhouse gas. In fact, per mole, per unit of methane, it's more... Uh, potent than um, CO2. However, CO2 is probably the biggest problem. But you can see here, for, even from just 1988, we've gone from around about, I'm sorry about these units, this is what happens when you pick up some graphs from physicists and some graphs from uh, chemists. Chemists love to talk about nanomoles per uh, mole and uh, physicists like talking about um, parts per million or whatever. 
So here you can see we're going from 1700, we're now going to 1900. We're seeing that increase in methane. And that comes from things like farming and so on. And we then put those together, and here you can see this is the CO2 increase from that La Herma Rona, uh, Hawaii data, going up to just before 2020. This is quite an old graph now, I'm afraid. And if you look at the blue line, the blue line is the amount of um, fossil fuel, coal, gas, and oil we burnt. We can calculate roughly, as a planet, how much we burnt through driving, through heating, through all the other things we use fossil fuels for. And you can see there's a very distinct link between the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and the amount we've actually emitted. And OK, the emissions getting away from ourselves here. That's partly because the ocean is absorbing that CO2, which increases acidity, which is causing big problems. It's also partly because we're seeing an increase, a small increase, in the amount of plankton in the oceans. And that, again, is absorbing that CO2. And if we then look at our temperature anomalies, this is our temperature um, in green, showing the sort of the wobbly bits, and then we can smooth that a bit if we want to, and get a moving average, and you can see the temperature is also increasing. This is atmospheric temperature, that's also in increasing alongside everything else. So we can see that link between greenhouse gases and the way in which our oceans and our atmosphere are increasing. And we can link that to what we've emitted over the past century. And we can see that when we look at the oceans. This is a satellite picture. Uh, this is an image taken from uh, last week. And this is looking at sea surface temperature anomalies. Red is warmer than it should be. Blue is colder than it should be. And so around sort of where I work down here, so Hampton, so Hampton Water, uh, parts of the channel. At the moment, this is the anomaly for a week ago. And this is comparing to the 20-year average. We can see the anomaly in the channel and the western approaches to uh, the RSC. Uh, that represents a warming of about two degrees over and above what we'd expect over the last 20 years. So locally, we've seen globally we've increased by about one and a half degrees. Locally, we've seen bigger increases. And I've worked in Soden for many years now. I've seen during winter an increase in temperature, the lowest temperature in the ocean around Southampton Water and Soden used to be down at three and a half degrees. I've not seen it drop between nine, eight and a half, nine degrees for the last five or six years. So it's consistently warmer. And you can also see in the Atlantic, we're getting this very warm water um, in the mid-Atlantic here, but also right up here in the Arctic, we're also seeing that warming. What's interesting is you do get cold patches. you are getting cold patches along here. That's the Africa upwelling zone and the Portuguese upwelling zone here. We're getting more uh, upwelling in those areas. Um, and we can also see anomalies in the Gulf Stream here, which is a bit disconcerting. But generally speaking, we're seeing a steady warming of our oceans. So who cares? We live in Britain. It's OK. You know, we're looking forward to that tropical um, uh, climate around Britain. You can imagine palm trees you know, around the school playing field. But actually, um, it affects our weather. It affects our day-to-day -day life here. Because we rely very heavily on there being relatively cold water over the Arctic. And right down here, where we're getting a low anomaly over the Azores, we're expecting that to be uh, warmer. And we rely on the warm waters over the Azores, the very cold waters over the Arctic, because that basically dries the jet stream. And that means we get very low pressure up here in the Arctic, very high pressure down here in the Azores. And what that does is it literally funnels the Gulf Stream. It restricts the way in which, sorry, the jet stream. It restricts the way in which the atmospheric jet stream meanders. Whereas it's a bit like sort of having a really tight uh, hold on the way in which the jet stream moves. You've got this high pressure differential. And so the jet stream should normally be really restricted to this sort of very tight wobble, this meander going across the globe. And actually, up until recently, the jet stream had been moving slowly northward. As we release the ice up here, as we start to see these temperatures increase, this pressure increases. The pressure down here is decreasing, so the differential between the two is getting weaker. And that means that the jet stream is wobbling a lot more. And that's why we get so many extremes. You know, one day we've got Arctic conditions in the middle of August, the next day, we've got the warmest um, 
Halloween ever on record. You know, in the States, uh, one day um, they got drought in sort of Boston. The next day they've got snow down in Texas. And that's because we've got this huge wobble in the jet stream. And that's driven by the fact that the temperature differential in the oceans is changing. But there's a bigger effect than that. And that's what's worrying me as an oceanographer. And that is the fact that we're seeing less ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. This is a picture of the ice cover. Um, this is showing the ice cover um, in, actually, we haven't got September 2023 yet. I'm sorry about that. We'll get that uh, next week sometime. This is the ice extent in 2023. And you can see the uh, pink line around here is the median for 1981 to 2010. <coughs> And you can see the ice is diminishing quite rapidly here in September. September, October is when we get minimum ice cover. Um, this is the ice cover, uh, a more detailed one, for this year, 2023. And you can see here, this is looking at the percent of ice cover. 100% is white, 20%, uh, 10% as you go down towards blue. We're, gonna, we're expecting to see this year as being the lowest ice cover on record in the Arctic certainly since we've been measuring this. And once upon a time, you had these areas like the Northwest Passage, which is this mysterious passage that goes between Greenland and Canada, and it's a quick way to get from Europe into the Pacific, rather than going through the Suez Canal, or the Panama Canal, or right around the Cape, both Capes. And that passage is open most of the year now. And in fact, we've also got the Northeast Passage. In fact, one of the trips we planned a while ago with Cape Farewell was to try and do the Northeast Passage. It's a long story. It involved Putin. Um, and um, basically, you can now go through the Northeast Passage as well. So those waterways have opened up because we're seeing less and less ice cover. And that has an effect on the ocean circulation because ice is critical in driving the deep ocean circulation. This is the sort of map of ice. This is sort of a, a graphical representation of the ice cover. Um, the gray area here is the um, sort of inter-decadal uh, range between 1981 and 2010. Um, the thick line in the middle is the average, and that's the range over those years. And these are the years since. And as I said, 2012 was the lowest one uh, until recently. At the moment, we're expecting 2023 to be down here. We don't have the data yet. That'll come through next week. Um, and the, the same with the Antarctic. We're seeing the Antarctic ice. This is 2022, last year. 2022 saw the lowest levels of the Antarctic. Obviously, different time of year. Their summer is our winter and vice versa. So their minimum ice cover is usually around about March, April. But you can see we're losing ice at a phenomenal rate. We've probably lost about half of the ice in the Arctic sea ice in the Arctic over the course of the past uh, 15, 20 years. And I remember saying a while ago, by the time we get to the end of this decade, there's a fair chance that in summer, we'll be able to sail to the North Pole without getting caught up in ice. And that has an important effect on our circulation. This is the circulation of the ocean. And the red stuff is the surface. We're going to come back to this in a minute. And you can see here, we've got the Gulf Stream coming across. Uh, it comes down towards Iberia and Northwest Africa. There comes the Canary Current, then it comes back round and becomes the Equatorial Current coming round. And we get this gyre, this sort of circulation of water uh, creating this sort of mid-Atlantic uh, gyre. And we've got the same with the Pacific. We've all heard of the mid-Pacific gyre. People call it the Pacific Garbage Patch. Just to disappoint you, it's not a garbage patch. If you go out there looking for the garbage patch, you'll be bitterly disappointed, but that's another lecture. Um, and uh, all the oceans, north and south, have these big gyres. And what happens in the Atlantic is unique. And in the Atlantic, you can see we've got this extension coming up towards Britain, past Norway, and up towards the Arctic. Now, people often talk about the fact that... Um, we, we benefit from the Gulf Stream here in Britain. And as a young scientist, I always got frustrated with that because it's actually, strictly speaking, called the North Atlantic Drift. We'll call it the Gulf Stream, I don't care. I, I've, I've got over that now. But basically, it's what's called the North Atlantic Drift. That's an extension of the Gulf Stream. It breaks away from the main Gulf Stream, comes up, 
It keeps Britain relatively warm, and it keeps Norway, certainly the coast of Norway, relatively ice-free. And the reason it happens is because up here, in the high Arctic, we get ice formation. And when the ice forms, the ice itself is pure water ice. That means that the ice, when it forms, expels the salt. We get this very cold, cold because it's freezing, brine cells. And these brine, cold brines then sink <coughs> and they create the deep ocean circulation. That's the blue stuff. So that's sinking down to the deep parts of the ocean and then it's spreading through the ocean. It fills the deep ocean. Um, and then as it does so, it's like taking the plug out of the plug hole on the bath. That surface water goes towards the hole. It goes down the plug hole. That's what's happening here. We've taken the plug out in the Arctic, it's drawing water up past Britain, past Europe and Northern Europe, and then it sinks to create this um, deep water. If the ice stops forming, that draw no longer happens. People often talk about the Gulf Stream shutting down. You've probably seen it in the press every so often. Scientists talking about the Gulf Stream shutting down. The Gulf Stream's not going to shut down. The North Atlantic Drift might, and that's one of the big worries. We've got teams. I'm not involved with these teams directly at the moment. We've done some work with Cape for a while on this one. Um, we've got teams at NOC uh, and around the world who are looking at exactly this. Is the, Gulf, is the extension of the Gulf Stream shutting down? If it shuts down, we're on the same level here in street as Alaska. So rather than having palm trees around the uh, football pitch or the hockey pitch, you'll have ski slopes. I mean, there are advantages. I like skiing. Who doesn't? Um, but it's not what you might expect. We could see a completely different sort of climate occurring here in Britain. And when we look at the sort of the patterns of heating and cooling, um, this is looking at the, this is you know, boring stuff, bit of science. This is the annual heat flux into the ocean in watts per square meter. The bottom line here is the energy goes in here at the equator and we lose it at the poles. So there's lots of heat down here and there's gain of heat in the equator, and it's the ocean currents that redistribute that heat. And people often ask the question, well, does the atmosphere drive the ocean, or does the ocean drive the atmosphere? The answer is yes. Because actually, that temperature distribution, so going back to this one, that warm water in the sort of tropical areas is creating a sort of a warm, moist air which rises, it's light, and so as it rises, uh, it goes up into the upper atmosphere here, and we get these things called Hadley cells. So there's the warm air at the equator rising, spreading out northward, and as it goes northward, it's moist, it's cooling, it loses that water, which is why it always rains a lot around the equatorial area, and then finally it sinks and then comes back again. And we add to that the Earth's rotation, we get what's called Coriolis. If you become an oceanographer or a marine biologist or an atmospheric physicist, you know all about Coriolis. It drives everything we do. Everything is affected by the Earth's rotation. It means we get these gyres. We get the sort of westerlies and the easterlies. And this is what the basic structure of the um, wind looks like down on the ground. And that drives the ocean circulation, which is in turn driving the atmosphere, which drives the oceans. You get the general pattern that they are interlinked um, inextricably. And so that's what our surface circulation looks like. And there's our North Atlantic drift, become the, eastern, the Norwegian coastal current, and so on, and then finally it sinks, and becomes the East Greenland current, sinks and goes down back to the equator. And if I look at the ocean as a cross-section, then you can see here the temperature shows that we have a very distinctive upper layer and a very cold and deep lower layer. And the ocean is a two-layer system. The top layer is exposed to the atmosphere, the top layer is all the gas exchange takes place. The deeper layer, the only way the deeper layer is formed is at the poles, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And so in order for, say, a radionuclide or something, or some atmospheric contamination to go from here at the equator down to, let's say, a thousand metres, the quickest way to do it is via the poles. It takes, it's quicker to travel horizontally several tens of thousand kilometres than it is to travel vertically one kilometre. That's the way the oceans work. So they are two very separate systems. The life in the oceans is very separate from the upper layer to the lower layer, and that's the lower layer as well. And so when we start looking at this picture again, we start to realise that actually uh, all of this stuff down here, this deep stuff, is actually formed in the 
upper parts of our planet. And if I look at the formation processes, the places where it forms, uh, these crosses show where we get deep water formation. That's 2,000, 3,500-metre water. That's 3,500 to bottom water. This is looking at the Atlantic. It's similar in the Pacific. And you can see there are only two or three places this happens. Uh, in the Arctic, up here. In the Antarctic, down here. There is some Mediterranean water that comes out. That's a bit of an anomaly. It's not very much. In fact, I did my PhD looking at that. It comes out into the Atlantic. And um, that's important, but not as important as the two main processes happening up here, around Svalbard, and down here in the Weddell Sea and in the Antarctic. So if we don't form this deep water, we stop the ocean circulation, the deep ocean. It stops. We're not sure what happens to that happens. We lose the oxygen um, supply. It means that life in the deep ocean, there's lots of it, suddenly becomes deprived of oxygen. It means the whole ocean circulation changes. We only need something like about 0.1 of a degree change in the deep water to completely reverse the circulation of the deep ocean water stop it. A very small change. And so when we start looking at how old some of that water is, this is looking at the Antarctic bottom water. It's probably the most prolific water on the planet today. Um, if you had to sort of say how much of your swimming pool was made up of Atlantic bottom water, about half of it. So half of the entire ocean is Atlantic bottom water. And actually, uh, this is showing the age. This is going from naught, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 700 years to travel. And so this is where these waters are formed, down in the Antarctic, hence Antarctic bottom water. And you can see here in the Atlantic, it takes about 700 years for that water to go north and get up into the North Atlantic. It takes seven, 800 years to go into the North Pacific for 820 years up here. It takes a long time for that water to percolate through. So the stuff that's up here, if you sample this stuff up here, that actually was last at the surface around about 1,200, a long time ago. And so the stuff we're putting in the ocean today is going to appear back at the surface in about 1,000 years' time. And that's quite worrying. So all the stuff that's absorbed and going down into the ocean today will come back and bite us one day. So how do we get this message across? Well, David, who's sitting in the audience, and part of the Atkinson, uh, Atkinson um, display is about Cape Provel. And David came to see me, one of my postdocs, 20-odd years ago now, um, with this crazy idea that he wanted to go and explore the Arctic with a group of artists, musicians, writers, and so on, and scientists, because he felt that scientists weren't doing a particularly good job, or more to the point, weren't being listened to by the general public. And that, I guess back in 2000, um, lots of people were sceptical about climate change. The only people who are sceptical these days also think the Earth is flat, and aliens inhabit uh, most of America. Um, and he came up with this idea of Cape Well. I think at the time we thought he was mad, but actually as it turned out it was quite inspirational. And the idea basically is you get groups of scientists, artists and so on, uh, going up, in this case, to start with in the Arctic, and I'll explain what we do these, these days, uh, looking at this change in the formation of the deep water, um, and at the same time taking well-known artists, writers, musicians and so on, <coughs> to follow that story. Um, and to write about it, to uh, put it into their art. David does some amazing stuff. David's an artist. Um, to put it into their music. People like Katie Stunson and Jarvis Cocker, into their music. But Ian McEwan was one of the people on one of the drop voyages, and he wrote his book Solar, based around the work he did with David uh, up in the Arctic. And in fact, when um, uh, just before Ian McEwan's book was published, I had the Times literary editor ring me up, because um, he was doing an article on it before it was published, he said, Simon, Ian's new book. He said, um, is the character, main character based on you? I said, well, apart from the fact he's balding, fat and divorced, no, not really. Um, but, um, um, but what it means is that you're getting a different perspective on the way in which we see the climate change. We use this ship, the Nordlich. We use it a lot in the past. Why? Um, well, both David and I like sailing ships. I did say we do this for fun as well. So we're getting paid to go on the sailing ship. It's tough, but someone's got to do it. But also, it actually is green. We're going up the sailing. And it's good for making documentaries. 
rather than a sort of standard diesel uh, research ship. You've got those as well, but it means you've got this sort of very uh, evocative um, platform to work from. Uh, just an example I can show you. I can give you an entire lecture, several lectures on some of the stuff that's gone on. I'm not going to do that today. This is one example. Um, this is some work um, carried out by, I've just completely forgotten... Sunan. Sunan, thank you, who, who was the uh, president of the Royal Institute of Architects a few years ago. Um, this is up in Greenland. Um, Sunan wanted to show what the average person's output of CO2 looks like. So the idea was we went to shore here and we were going to float these four weather balloons to show the cubic capacity of your output from one year and show the fact that this entire sort of uh, fjord in, Norway, in, uh, in Greenland uh, would fill from the CO2 from a small village. Um, it looks perfect. It's a really good inspirational piece. What you don't see here is the fact that it probably took about 1,500 shots to get this particular perfect shot. What you don't see is the catabatic wind blowing down uh, from the glacier behind here, um, basically pushing the weather balloons to the ground. We lost two or three weather balloons while we were trying to do it. And eventually, after several thousand pictures, we got this one picture where all the weather balloons are upright. But it shows, it's a way of demonstrating what our output looks like, what our CO2 look, looks like. And it was good fun. And just to show that I do get involved with art as well as science, there we go, I'm there doing some art. Actually, I also had to drive the rib that day because there was no one else qualified to drive it, but anyway. Um, so, as I said, that's sort of some of the art that goes on. One of the trips we're interested in looking at is the whole Gulf Stream or the extension of the Gulf Stream shutting down. And so this particular trip was going from Svalbard, in theory going down the coast of Greenland and then ending up in Iceland. And so we were doing this cross section across here. Um, we were using various bits of instrumentation from the ship and also putting in buoys so we could actually measure whether the jet stream, sorry, the um, extension of the Gulf Stream the North Atlantic Drift was weakening. Now that particular year, there was a bit of a panic because the satellites implied that it had disappeared altogether. It had gone. And so it was a perfect time to be out there to look at this. And as I said, we used probes from the ship. We also used these things called Argo floats. Um, on a proper research vessel, I have a team of technicians and engineers. I've got lots and lots of winch equipment and so on and so forth. On a schooner in the middle of the Arctic, I've got me, me and me. That's me being a technician, engineer, and also the crane. Um, and that's the point at which you try to remember whether you switch it on or not, as you're about to deploy 45,000 pounds worth of buoy uh, into the ocean. Uh, I had, and this is just some examples of the data. And that's another trip. That's probably the world's most um, signed Argo float going to the water. People like Jarvis Cocker and so on signing it before it went in. So if you find that, that's a special edition, if you find that washing up on your beach at some stage. And the idea of the Argo floats is they don't need us there. They basically sink to a set depth. They drift for, we actually set them for five days. I wanted rapid uh, measurements, typically nine or ten days. Then they pop up to the surface, transmit data. They sample the way down, they sample as they go along, they pop up. We get a feel for what currents are doing by how much they've moved. But also, as they're going up and down, they're sampling temperature, salinity, a whole variety of parameters which we can then use to understand how the oceans are changing. And these are really, really useful buoys. And actually, one of the nicest things about being an oceanographer or marine biologist is that all the data we collect is open access. According to the International Law of the Sea, uh, the UN's Law of the Sea, we have to make all our data available to everyone. And some stuff we collect from ships, we have about two years sort of moratorium to actually use the data. It's very frustrating if you get back from your cruise having just spent um, a whole month being sick at sea and collecting data and then getting back to discover someone's already written your data up. So we do get two years to do that. But a lot of the data, like the Argo floats, is open access. You can go online. You can actually look at the satellite data from NASA and look at the ocean temperature, how it's changed, any part of the ocean you want. You can look at any Argo float. Today, there are 3,900 Argo floats popping up and down. Overall, there's 18,500 archive data sets from the Argo floats. Um, really impressive stuff. So if you want to go and look at the oceans, type, type in Argo floats. 
you'll get Argus and find all kinds of deals in Argus to start with, but if you ignore the Argus deals, you'll find the Argo floats, and it's worth looking at if you're interested in looking at the ocean. And a combination of that and the, uh, the data we got from the ship, this is going from Spitsbergen, so this is actually looking from the North Pole south, there's Spitsbergen there, and as we go across, we're going towards uh, Greenland, this way. And this is temperature. Up here, we've got this really cold water, this tongue of cold water, which extends 200 kilometres from Spitsbergen. And what had happened that particular year was the ice melt in Spitsbergen, the glaciers had disappeared so quickly that it's literally poured up to 200 kilometres offshore a 10 to 15 metre layer of fresh water which is hiding the extension of the Gulf Stream. At this stage we call it the um, West Spitsbergen Current. The extension of the Gulf Stream. That's the extension there and we can't see it from space because it sits beneath this cold fresh water layer. What we see from space is this very small warmer layer over here and this is what caused mass panic with scientists thinking that's it, we shut down, we're all doomed, we may as well sort of go wild and party and blow our bank accounts and credit cards because we're doomed. Do after tomorrow stuff. But actually, it's still there, it's still going, reasonably strong. It is weakening, there's no doubt about it. But we do need to use satellites, we do need to use ships, we need to use all the tools we have to be able to map what's going on. And this energy here, this energy from this core, if you like, this river of warm water, that's six and a half degrees there, it's three degrees around here. It's about... This river is about 100 kilometres wide, and it's got a, a depth of about 80 metres. There's more energy in that river than 10,000 nuclear power stations. That's the sort of energy levels we're looking at. It's phenomenal. Now, working at sea is fun, and we get used to it. Um, people often say, do you get seasick? Everyone gets seasick at some stage. But generally speaking, uh, we get used to it. And one of the things that does frustrate the artists and the writers and the film crews is the fact that we're bouncing around happy, having another bacon sandwich or whatever, or obviously, if you're vegan, a vegan bacon sandwich, um, whilst they're all being sick. And this is what our normal um, habitat looks like. Now, some of you, how many, how many people here are doing science A-levels? Most of you? That's good to see. Um, in your labs, do you have a nice dry lab? Yeah. Do you have lights and things? Does it move up and down? Does anyone come and pour buckets of three-degree water over your head? <laughs> no, no. Um, they do with us, and that's what we work in. That's, our, that's, my, oops, blimey. that's my working environment there. Um, as you can see, <coughs> okay, a bit extreme. It's quite windy that day. We work in that. Okay, we do strap ourselves on um, to the ship. My wife's very pleased to see that. Um, we do strap ourselves on to the ship uh, while we're sampling. But we sort of put along, that's our working environment. And it's going up and down, it's wet. Uh, it's cold, um, there's nothing quite as bad as having to get up at or your watch at midnight to put on your X4 suit, which is still cold and wet from the day before. And you do wonder at that stage, why didn't I do and become a, uh, I don't know, an English graduate or something instead, much, much safer. But actually, once you get out there, it's great fun. Um, but this is a comedian called Marcus Brigstoke. Uh, and this is Marcus not enjoying the crossing between uh, Svalbard and Greenland. And on that particular trip, we did have some problems. We had big storms, lots of ice, uh, which we had to avoid. And uh, Marcus, the film crew, and so on, spent most of their six days uh, doing the crossing, which should have taken about a day, like that. Um, it was miserable. Even worse was the fact that the scientists were bouncing around, enjoying life, um, and getting on with it. Um, the other problem you get in those conditions, you get icebergs, and... Um, if you hit one of those, then basically that's it. Uh, so you have to avoid those icebergs. You've got people up front shouting out, ice to starboard or ice to port. And then the helm, who was at the helm at the time, has to avoid the ice. If you're unlucky, every so often you'll get a, a simultaneous ice to starboard and ice to port. And that's the result of ice to starboard and ice to port. Now, on this particular trip, we had a, um, a wonderful helm, wonderful skipper called Yurt. Yurt, Dutchman, man of few words, <coughs> brilliant seaman, uh, sailed the seven seas, knows his stuff, um, but certainly a man of few words. Hi Yurt, how are you doing? Yeah, 
Cup of tea? No. Biscuit? No. That's about it, really. Um, man, a few words. And he's the sort of guy that shimmies up the mast in the Force 8 uh, in his welly boots or his bare feet. So anyway, uh, he's mad as well as being Dutch. So um, that's Yurt. And on that particular trip, Marcus and the film crew, a couple of others, said to me, look, Simon, if we hit an iceberg and we sink, how long will it take a helicopter to get to us? <coughs> and I said, ah, the tricky thing is we're beyond range of helicopters here. Uh, there isn't a helicopter on the planet that has that range to get out to us and back again. We see their little faces sinking a bit. OK, Simon, so if we sink tomorrow, how long will it take a boat to get to us? I said, well, nearest port, Scorsby Sund, is actually iced in at the moment. They can't get anything out. Nearest boat, four days. We see their little faces sink a little bit further. I think Dave was asleep at this stage. And so Marcus said to me, look, Simon, go have a chat with you. He won't speak to us. You want to know for you work at sea. He'll speak to you. Go and ask him how we're doing. So reluctantly, I put my X4 suit on, cold, wet and clammy. Went out onto the deck. There's Yurt at the helm, plowing through the waves. And I said, Yurt. He said, yes. I said, Yurt, we're surrounded by ice. Yeah. <coughs> we've got a four, actually, at that stage, we've got a Force 10 forecast coming in from Iceland tomorrow. He said, yeah. I said, what do you think? Yeah, we're rather f***ed. <laughs> now, I went back down below, and they were all sitting there saying, so what did you say? I said, we're fine, we'll be there soon. Absolutely <laughs> fine, no problem at all. I had a chat with you, I think Dave had a chat with you afterwards, and I think you admitted that was the worst crossing he'd ever had in his 40, 50 years working at sea. Uh, it was a rough crossing. Anyway, eventually, we found a gap. That's a gap in the ice there. That's the Nord Lake pushing its way through a gap in the ice. Uh, luckily, the Force 10 uh, went south and hit Scotland instead. Sorry, Scotland. And um, that's Marcus, at long last, finding terra firma and enjoying his first breakfast for heavens knows how many weeks or days. And David, who then came up with the next job, which is to do some art, and he wanted someone to wear a survival suit and drift around in the ice. It's art. I don't understand it either, but anyway, it's art. Um, Marcus, unfortunately, was down below at the time and didn't know what the plan was. He popped up on deck and Marcus said, what are we doing, chaps? And David said, well, we're trying to see if this survival suit fits anyone, if it's everyone, even me. And Marcus said, I bet it fits me, popped it on, and hey, presto, guess what? Marcus had to be, is it humankind? I can't say mankind in their environment, can I? Humankind in their environment. So that's Marcus drifting around on the ice. It, it's art, it's good. Um, and he actually quite liked it in the end. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, this seal popped up. Now, bear in mind where we were off the Greenland coast, our nearest habitation was probably about 500 miles from the nearest human habitation. And I'm guessing seals had never seen humans, let alone humans in red skins like that. So you can imagine a seal looking very curiously at Marcus drifting around in the water. And it disappeared. And about three minutes later, it popped up with his mate. You can imagine it going, look, come and see this. You've got to come and see this. Look, really, it's, I don't know what it is. It's not a seal. It's not a polar bear, but it's weird. Anyway, they both popped up and watched, it, watched Marcus for a while. And then the, um, the film crew and the artists on board said, oh, there's more seals coming. And Yurt and his crew got their binoculars out and said, oh, no, they're not seals. They're polar bears. And they're the three polar bears that came along as Marcus was drifting around in the water. You've never seen a comedian get out of the water so fast in life. God, he was fast. Um, unfortunately, although Marcus had his first breakfast for a long time, the polar bears didn't. So the poor mum and her two cubs had to go hungry and couldn't have a comedian for lunch or breakfast. So anyway, polar bears, a slight problem. Um, and this is one of the interesting things about being an oceanographer. OK, I did my degree in oceanography. I did my PhD in oceanography, and I work in oceanography. <coughs> But we also have to have, we have to do sea survival on a regular basis. We have to pass our sea survival. We have to do, I have to do quite advanced first aid, because if we're in the middle of the Arctic, we might well be, or in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific, we might well be quite a long way from hospital or for any sort of medical support. And we also have to do quite a lot of other things as well, including, if you work in the Arctic, polar bear defence. Now, uh, this is Bob, and Bob, of <coughs> course, the uh, Eastern Canadian Institute of Architects, um, Bob designed one of the big Olympic um, centres, didn't he? Yeah. Um, I shared a cabin with Bob. Bob was great. This is Bob's approach to defence against polar bears. Very handy because polar bears get things stuck between their teeth and there's nothing more useful 
then lunch coming with a toothpick. And so one of the other things we have to do, um, which is not my favourite part of the job, because I hate them, is we also have to har carry um, uh, guns with us as well. So we have to do firearms training um, and have to carry high-velocity rifles. I hasten to add, <coughs> before you think, poor polar bears, um, we, I've never, in fact, I know of no one who's ever had to shoot a polar bear. In fact, I know of no one who's even had to fire above their heads. But you don't mess around with polar bears because if you do have one come towards you, you want to be prepared. So as I said, we have to be prepared for this sort of thing. And we get training in that as well. It's a very wide sort of training we get as ocean <coughs> officers. And in fact, on one of the trips, I remember, I don't remember, David remembers this, we were doing some filming of a polar bear stalking a, um, a deer across a, a water inlet. And um, it was great, there was about 10 of us there. I wasn't on, on duty that day, one of my colleague Sarah was. And as we were watching this polar bear, uh, just trying to stalk this deer, polar bear was quite weak, the deer got away. It was one of those David Attenborough type moments. And as we finished and sort of turned around, there was a polar bear not very far away talking about you know, 10, 20 metres, coming towards us. And we all went, gosh. And you can see the polar bear stopping and thinking, there's 10 of them, one of me. Actually, generally speaking, polar bears aren't stupid. It decided it wasn't worth the risk and it turned and ran. The only unfortunate thing was that on the video, we've got some fantastic video, what we're looking at with Sarah's comment saying, call blimey, look at the arse on that as it ran away. So a David for a moment, do you remember that? <laughs> David for a moment, completely ruined by a scientist. But just to show scientists don't just do science and ruin videos, um, this is my last slide, and this is, um, we were working up the uh, west coast of, of Greenland. Um, the west coast of Greenland is the very, very heavily populated area. Greenland is about the size of India. Do you know what the population of Greenland is? Any guesses? 3,000. 3,000. Not quite that low, but pretty low, 50,000, 55,000. Not many people in Greenland. Um, the East Coast, the entire East Coast, I think it's got about 500 people. And that East Coast has a longer um, coastline than Britain. Um, the West Coast is the populated one, and this was in Umanak. And uh, Umanak has a, it's a big city. It's about 1,500 people in Umanak. It's the big smoke. And there's a band playing on stage. And uh, we, had, we were there with Katie Tunstall and Jarvis Cocker and a few other people um, who were world-renowned. And uh, the band playing on stage said, anyone out there playing any music? And uh, Katie said, come on, we're going to play some music. So ended up going up on stage, and she was short of her backing vocals. So uh, that's Emily and Carol, two of the scientists on stage, being backing vocals to uh, Katie Tunstall. And one of the Greenlandic guys, obviously we were there drinking soft drinks with serious scientists. <coughs> and one of the guys, the local guys, was leaning up against the bar and said to me, your friends are very good, aren't they? I said, they're not bad. He said, she's almost as good as the real thing. Apparently, the following day, in one of the National Greenland papers, there was this bit about, suddenly out of the blue, this group of international musicians arrived, did a gig, and disappeared again. So, as I said, science is fun. Science is very, very broad, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. Thank you. <laughs> Any, any, any questions? I also hasten to add, I've never owned a white coat in my life, so sorry about the chemists, but I've never actually, I've owned a few survival suits, but no white coats. Any questions? Yeah? So, Philip's question, how do you date your water in that chart about? Okay, you... there are various ways of doing it. Now, one good way of doing it, sort of in recent years, is using tritium. Uh, now, the only source of tritium on the planet is when we started <laughs> playing with hydrogen bombs in the 1950s. And the only way that uh, uh, an airborne gas can get into the ocean is at the surface. So if there's tritium in the water, we know that that was introduced um, in the 1950s or later. So we can certainly say that we can get that sort of 1955, 57 front as it goes through the oceans. When we look at other isotopes, um, we can look at those isotopes. We can also look at ocean circulation patterns from measurements. And we can do this sort of combination of dating with isotopes, which have come in through the atmosphere, because the only way they can get in there is through the surface waters and uh, also by looking at ocean currents as well. Any other questions? Yes? Just about AI and oceanography, do you think that's going to change the way that you're working? No, not particularly. I think, um, I mean, we are using more and more robotic systems, and they are good. 
Um, and I have to say, you know, we, I got fairly heavily involved in the um, Titan submersible, which went down a few weeks, well, a few months ago now, um, when it was going down to the Titanic and imploded. Um, we don't use any of those because we never have for science. There's no point. They are pointless because we can do more with a robotic system. Um, but in terms of AI generally, we do, we've always used models. So we've always used numerical models to try and model not just ocean circulation, but also climate change. We use them for um, ecosystems, looking at biology. Um, but ultimately, we use a combination of those with uh, measurements and so on. So I'll never say never, but AI has a purpose, I suppose, in terms of our robotic systems. It means that we don't stop going to sea. It just means we can make more measurements so a research ship is expensive. So if I want a, a day on, say, Discovery or uh, James Cook, the two big UK uh, ships, or on, say, the Charles Darwin, uh, sorry, the uh, David Attenborough, sometimes known as Boatman at Boatface. I mean, Boatman at Boatface costs about 120,000 pounds a day to run. So they're expensive things. So the more we can do using robotic systems, um, which probably cost about that these days but they'll run for a year or two. Um, so a combination of robotic systems, satellites, aircraft, and ships gives us a really good picture. But it, we're not looking at AI taking over. I'm not expected to be replaced by uh, artificial intelligence anytime soon. Yeah? Uh, other than like CO2 and methane, are there any other like, important contaminants in the oceans that you should worry about? <sighs> Certainly, increasing CO2 means we're getting an increase in acidity, and that's a big problem. Uh, and that is affecting things like, um, but both the temperature changes and the acidity changes affecting corals globally. One of my colleagues, in fact, two doors down from my office, is one of the world's experts in just that. Um, and um, that's one concern. Plastics, an interesting one. Plastics is one of those things that everyone is taking on board. Even the Sun and the Daily Mail think plastics is a problem. Ironically, it has to be said, the science jury is still out on that one as to how much of a problem it is. And I said earlier, right at the beginning, you get these sort of pictures of sort of the um, Pacific garbage patch. Um, and it doesn't look anything like that. You know, uh, if you sort of go out to the middle of the Pacific, you'd have to do a trawl of about two or three kilometres to get a petri dish full of plastics. It's not like going out and shoveling it into a bucket. <coughs> Having said that, we did go to a, an island called Muffin Island, um, which is, I know, Muffin Island, it's a protected island by the UN. It's a walrus sanctuary just to the north of Svalbard, one of the most northern parts before you hit sort of the pole. Um, the worrying thing there was, first of all, it was ice-free so we could get to it. The other thing was that we were planning to do some sampling for plastics to see if we had any plastics in that high remote part of the world. We didn't need any sampling equipment. We literally went ashore and the shore was completely littered. I got a, some great pictures showing um, a box full of plastic recovered from that beach, including the box itself. There were supermarket bags from, it was an international collection of supermarket bags from Canada, from America, from France, Britain, Denmark, Germany, and so on. Um, so plastics is a concern. Um, and I'll be honest and say, we don't know how to concern yet. Um, certainly, we need to stop putting plastic in because it's a bit late if we decide in 10 years time, this is seriously, seriously important. Um, so let's stop now. There's no benefit to putting plastics in the ocean. So plastics is one of the things. Um, biodiversity, you know, there's concerns about is the biodiversity being affected by changes in climate and so on. So there's a lot out there. So there's a plenty of science to keep you lot going for a long time if you want to become a marine biologist or an oceanographer. Um, so is, you know, there's lots. Of, and of course, there's positives. It's not all negative. Um, there's a lot of work now on renewables. One of the biggest areas of new employment for oceanographers these days and marine biologists is marine renew renewables, tidal energy, offshore wind farms, offshore solar farms, heat energy from the oceans. A couple of my uh, ex-students are working for companies now in the Indian Ocean and they're looking at um, heat extraction for uh, energy for small <coughs> island communities and things. So a lot going on out there. Yeah? Have you done much work involving coral bleaching? And Not me personally. Um, I know about it, and I've, a lot of close friends and so on work on that as their day-to-day -day job. Um, it's a problem. The big problem with coral bleaching, do you know why corals bleach? Is it because they, like, get rid of, like, Suzanne's early or something? They eject? Genius. Yeah, well done. You can come and join us for a degree in marine biology. 
basically, it's not, it, it is the corals, but the corals have this symbiotic relationship with an algae. Uh, and that's what gives it the colour. And if the water's too warm, um, then what happens is the algae go from being a symbiotic um, positive to a negative. And so what the corals do is if it gets too warm, the algae start to go a bit toxic. Uh, they rely on the algae to give them food. Well, they don't eat the algae, they just rely on the algae to convert things, um, from nutrients to give them food. And it's fine while it's going well, but if it gets too warm, then the algae turn toxic, so the corals expel them. And they can afford to do that for at least a year. So coral bleaching is not new, and you get warm periods where the corals do that. The problem is, if it happens time and time again, then the, out the corals can't survive. So two or three years of bleaching means that they die. Add to that increased acidification, and the sort of calcite sort of shells tend to break down. So it's tough news for corals. Now, they can change. They can move. The big problem is that if you're looking at things like the Great Barrier Reef, that things are changing too quickly for them to migrate. They're quite slow in terms of migrating north or south. And in past history, they had moved. But because we're seeing such a rapid change in climate, then they can't move that quickly. And so that's the big problem we've got with corals. But well done. Any other questions? No, nope, I'm aware of it. Getting out of time now. All right, well, some thanks on, on behalf of everyone. Well, Phil, we, um, really appreciate you coming out and uh, talking about the ocean. Perhaps if, if you've got personal questions, perhaps if you're thinking of studying uh, at, at a university around the oceans, you could just come up here afterwards. Um, otherwise, if the rest of you um, head back to the house, and uh, if we could just give uh, Simon a round of applause. Thank you.